Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Dr. Sudarsha and Dr. Kamal Sethi for asking me to participate in this meeting. And I'd also like to thank Eris, especially Mr. Vijay Joshi, for personally getting me involved in this program. As Dr. Sethi said, uh, systolic hypertension is a problem. Uh, though <clears throat> among physicians and even cardiologists, less uh, you know, recognized or less of importance, but uh, more and more it is gaining importance and considered as important or probably more important in causing morbidity and mortality in hypertension. Uh, this is a typical scenario I'm sure uh, each one of you have seen people above the age of 60, uh, apparently normal and healthy condition, just having a systolic uh, blood pressure which is uh, elevated more than <clears throat> 140 and uh, most of the parameters are normal. So the dilemma comes, should we treat it or should we not treat it? Just leave it alone because this patient is apparently healthy, he has no symptoms, there are the biochemical parameters are normal, cardiovascular system is normal, should we treat? Now this is the, the classification of course we were looking forward to JNC8 recommendation, uh, hoping there will be some change but uh, so far there has been a significant delay in the announcement of JNC8 recommendation, it's almost uh, one and a half years behind schedule. Uh, but the latest uh, the European the category as well as the British Heart Society, uh, British Society of Hypertension. What is recommended is the optimal blood pressure is less than 120 and the absolute blood pressure less than 80. Normal blood pressure is less than 130 and less than 85 diastolic. High normal blood pressure, uh, what was earlier called pre-hypertension in 87, that is 130 to 139 systolic and diastolic 85 to 89. Now, we are interested today in this aspect. Isolated systolic hypertension is again present to grade 1 and grade 2. Grade 1 is the systolic is 140 to 159 and the diastolic less than 90. And grade 2 where the systolic hypertension is more than 160 and the diastolic is less than 90. <clears throat> this is what again Dr. Siti alluded to. See what happens uh, as age, a uh, uh, person ages, you see the systolic blood pressure gradually keeps on rising. This is seen both among men and women, whereas the diastolic blood pressure up to a level, of, say about 60 years, tends to rise and then actually comes down. Uh, this is a normal uh, phenomenon that is observed in the, you know, various age groups and ethnic groups in U.S. And uh, with the result end of the age of 60, you see there is a widening of pulse pressure, both among men and women. This is commonly seen all over, including in India. And uh, this is a phenomenon that we are concerned with today, that rise in systolic blood pressure and the rise in pulse pressure. Now this is what, again we have repeatedly agreed. I mean we all know hypertension is the commonest disease affecting mankind. I have considered it is much more common than even common cold or flu. So hypertension is the commonest disease affecting mankind. And it is said more than 75 years of age, almost 80% of the people will have hypertension. And older age group, if more than 80, 85 you take, almost 95% of the people will define to have hypertension. It is that common. I mean, almost everybody. That means almost everybody in, in this audience also, after the age of 60 or 65, there is a tendency for elevation of blood pressure uniformly. And by the age of 75, it, almost 80% of the group here will have hypertension by definition. And th that is the enormity of the problem as well as the, uh, the situation. And again this shows by age if we see more than 80 predominantly it is systolic hypertension whereas between the 40 to 50 years 
there is a combination majority having both systolic and diastolic hypertension. Now this is the issue. Actually this is the relation of stroke versus the diastolic blood pressure and this is the relation of stroke with systolic blood pressure. Actually you don't see any difference at all. So in our old concept that diastolic blood pressure is important and systolic is not important and uh, most of our focus was on controlling diastolic blood pressure and the teaching was that the diastolic blood pressure causes increases in stroke tend to reduce the diastolic blood pressure but if you really see here the incidence of the stroke increases with higher uh, not only related to the age as well as the level of the systolic blood pressure and this relation is same as that you see in diastolic blood pressure emphasizing that systolic hypertension isolated systolic hypertension is as important or more important in the cardiovascular morbidity mortality this is of course on the coronary artery disease ischemic heart disease mortality same thing you see this is the systolic hypertensive group and this is the diastolic hypertensive group you see the similar curve or association with systolic hypertension and coronary artery disease and diastolic hypertension and coronary artery disease now this shows the relation of systolic blood pressure and the pulse pressure you see higher the pulse pressure higher the systolic blood pressure higher the hazard ratio for coronary artery disease all these clearly indicate that systolic hypertension has a definite relation for stroke coronary artery disease morbidity and mortality now there is an issue about so called j curve i'm i'm sure again from most 40 more than 40 years this controversy exists is uh, is there a j curve in hypertension what has been shown definitely is this is published in 2010 you see the blood pressure actually over the age older the age group if there is a dip in pressure below you know especially the diastolic below uh, you know in the range of 60 to 70 and the systolic around 120 140 definitely the mortality increase in the sense when this is an important issue when you are managing systolic hypertension especially in elderly that we need to there is enough evidence to say that uh, higher the pressure higher the morbidity and mortality at the same time one should not bring down the blood pressure too low because then the mortality again increases mortality and morbidity increases there is a j curve phenomena in this now one of the landmark trial were clearly showed that systolic hypertension is associated with increased morbidity and mortality also showed managing systolic hypertension by medication significantly reduces the morbidity and mortality that is the systolic hypertension in the elderly program so called SHEP trial published in 1996 wherein 4736 men and women aged 60 years and older at baseline with isolated systolic blood pressure of more than 160 and at diastolic less than 90 at baseline and of this 580 people were actually diabetic and about 4,149 patients were non-diabetic. So there were isolated, I mean patients with isolated systolic hypertension and some of them were diabetic and these people were followed up for five years. The active treatment group received a low dose of chlorothalidone, 12.5 to 25 milligram, milligram per day with a step up to atrenolol in case the blood pressure was not controlled with chlorothalidone, they allowed addition of atrenolol or reserpine at that time uh, if needed. And a five-year major cardiovascular death rate was um, you know, measured. And what they found is it was the CVD rate was 34% less for active treatment group compared with placebo for both diabetic patients as well as for non-diabetic patients. So in all patients, uh, high risk, you know, associated with uh, diabetes and non-diabetic, just adding chlorothalidone and reducing the systolic hypertension brought down the mortality by 
in these patients with isosystolic hypertension. I'm sorry about this slide, people in the back may not be able to see. What it clearly showed, the major cardiovascular event rate was significantly less in the active group, both in diabetic patients and non-diabetic patients. Non-fatal and fatal attacks events were also significantly less in the treatment group compared to non-treatment group. Non-fatal MI and uh, coronary artery disease was much less in the treatment group. So all events, cardiovascular events, were much less in patients who were treated with chlorothalidone. Uh, <clears throat> another trial was the uh, systolic hypertension in Europe. There is a systolic Euro trial. It was published in 1997, wherein 4,695 patients were randomly assigned to nitrendipine, a diadropyridine, 10 to 40 mg daily with the possible addition of enalapril, 5 to 20 mg daily, and hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 to 25 mg daily on matching placebos. Among elderly patients with isolated systolic hypertension, antihypertensive drug treatment starting with nitrendipine reduces the rate of cardiovascular complications. Treatment of 1,000 patients for 5 years with this type of regimen may prevent 29 strokes or 53 major cardiovascular endpoints. I mean, this clearly shows that uh, the next class of drug, that is dihydropyridines, were also very effective in reducing morbidity and mortality. Uh, this is the <coughs> Kaplan-Meier curve, that you can clearly see the placebo group had a much higher incidence of fatal and non-fatal stroke as well as fatal and non-fatal myocardial infarction compared to the active treatment group, clearly showing that treating hypertension significantly brings down morbidity and mortality. Because in 2007, the meta-analysis comparing uh, more than 30 such trials clearly showed that uh, treatment with any medication, antihypertensive medication, systolic hypertension, brought down the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality by 34 percent is a uh, very big meta-analysis that is on systolic hypertension. Now, there is always an issue, fine, we treat systolic hypertension in a younger age group or let us say, say 60 or 70, but till recently the, it was not very clear what about very elderly patients above the age of 80 because many of us felt I mean, or feel uh, that, you know, with the old uh, formula that all of us have used that 100 plus the age uh, is the normal blood pressure for a person. So if a person is 75 years, 175 was considered to be a normal blood pressure for the person. And people always had this issue of the age of 80, should we really treat these patients aggressively? or just leave them alone because older the age group management there are you know these patients have multiple problems uh, whether aggressively treating hypertension will give any benefit however trial was HIVAT this is one trial which looked at very elderly patients more than 80 years of age with systolic isolated systolic hypertension and uh, treated with diuretics and they followed up and this study had to be stopped after two and a half years because there was, they found that there was a significant difference in the morbid mortality and they recommended that even after the 80, there is a benefit. And the benefit that is seen in treating this patient was as good as treating a younger patient. So similar benefit was achieved. So it is very clear now that even patients above the 80, one should treat isolated systolic hypertension. The only problem with HIVET uh, trial is that the, the patients who were included were very healthy. They did not have any comorbid uh, conditions. They were not sick. They were very healthy 80-year-olds. Now, this trial showed that in such group of patients who tolerated the antihypertensive medication, they did very well and the morbidity and mortality was reduced. Whether the same thing applies to most of our patients above the age of 80 who are sick, who have multiple uh, problems, whether they will tolerate antihypertensive medication, what is the incidence of orthostatic hypertension and other problems, we still do not know. So, but looking at overwhelming evidence of antihypertensive treatment in all age groups, I mean for almost now 
uh, more than 50 years we have been having evidence about the management of hypertension. Consistently there is a data to say that treating hypertension in any age group there is a benefit and it reduces the morbidity and mortality. Applying the same, I think even in those patients more than 80 years with comorbid condition, I think there is a justification in treating hypertension. Now, how do you evaluate uh, these patients with systolic hypertension? The initial evaluation of the patient with systolic hypertension should include an assessment for the presence of other cardiovascular risk factors. I think that applies to all hypertensive patients. It is not, you are not treating hypertension alone because most of these patients with hypertension, though it's a common disease, will have other conditions which increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. One is, of course, is diabetes. Second, of course, the major risk is dyslipidemia. I mean, now it is you know, very well known and the uh, recommendations that all patients with hypertension should get their lipid evaluated because it is a very common association. Similar to the common association diabetes, there is a very close link between hypertension and dyslipidemia. So every patient with hypertension should get his lipid assessed and his dyslipidemia should be treated aggressively. Uh, there is a recommendation. Similarly about the smoking, tobacco usage, obesity should also be looked into and you know reduce those risk factors. So one must look for presence of other cardiovascular risk factor because when we are treating one condition we should also look at other comorbid conditions which will also worsen the patient's outlook and aggressively treat those comorbid conditions. We should also look at endorgan damage because that alters the prognosis of the patient. Uh, every hypertensive patient, of course, more so with systolic hypertension, more so in the older age group, we must constantly look for any evidence of endorgan damage because that totally alters the outlook for the patient as well as how aggressively you would like to treat this patient group. Concomitant disease affecting the prognosis and treatment and identifiable and correctable cause of hypertension. This is again very common. Actually, one of the reasons why systolic hypertension, isolated cell is not considered serious is there are many other conditions. Uh, one of the common conditions is anemia. Severe anemia itself can produce systolic hypertension and hence many people do not take any cognizance. Hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, both are known to produce hypertension. Uh, so, uh, some of them can be correctable, corrected and they should be corrected. Now, aortic insufficiency of for any cause, coarctation of aorta, pseudo coarctation of aorta, especially in the elderly, all can cause systolic hypertension and they must be treated and they must be looked into. And of, one should also look at potentially contributing lifestyle factors. Now coming to the management, obviously like any other hypertension, you must concentrate on lifestyle modification, avoidance of smoking, cutting down on alcohol, definitely higher the amount of alcohol a person consumes, there is a much higher incidence of hypertension, so one sh uh, should control alcohol. Obesity is definitely related to hypertension. One should maintain optimum weight. Uh, salt consumption is very well known. Higher the salt intake, higher the blood pressure, so there must be a restriction in salt. Diuretics form the mainstay of treatment. Uh, JNC7, some subsequently British Heart Society and Canadian, so they all have, all have recommended that thiazide or uh, the diuretic should be the first line of treatment in systolic hypertension. Chlorothaladone is coming back. There are more and more uh, recommendations saying that chlorothaladone is a better diuretic compared to th even thiazide diuretic. Again, in elderly, there's a special significance because most of the elderly patients have a tendency for diabetes, and we know very well that thiazide group of diuretic worsen diabetes. Or uh, there is an increased incidence of new onset of diabetes with uh, prolonged use of thiazide uh, diuretic and hence uh, it is preferred chlorothaladone is used. I, I see now there is a resurgence and actually many companies have restarted marketing 
chlorothalidone. Uh, uh, that is a good thing and uh, most of the recommendations now say that chlorothalidone is a better diuretic. Diadropyridines are the next choice of a drug, especially long-acting diadropyridine, amlodipine, clonidipine, uh, these drugs which you know have a longer duration of action are ideal. Short-acting diadropyridine like nifedipine should be avoided because one of the major data that clearly show the short-acting diadropyridine drastically reduce the blood pressure. That fall in blood pressure increases the mortality and the morbidity for the patient. So it's always preferred that one use long-acting uh, or delayed uh, reaction or uh, <coughs> the kind of preparations uh, which over a sustained period of time slowly bring down the blood pressure than the short-acting diadropyridine. Non-diadropyridines are not shown to be very useful like diltiazam or uh, the verapamil and plus they have a lot more side effects. AC inhibitors have been shown, especially in the PROGRESS trial, clearly showed that addition of perindopril with thiazide significantly brought down the mortality. Of course, is it the diuretic? Of course, there is still debate going on in spite of uh, various trials. Uh, many still believe that it is reduction in blood pressure, irrespective of the drug that is used, is the one that causes the beneficial effect rather than a specific group of drug. Though from the cardio cardiologist's point of view, from the nephrologist's point of view, probably AC inhibitors and ERB seem to have an edge. But in a overall population, what is important is controlling the blood pressure. Whether you use a diuretic, whether you use a diadropyridine, or whether you use the AC inhibitor or the ARB, what is important is controlling the blood pressure. And AC inhibitors definitely, especially in those group of patients who have multiple risk factors for a sort of diabetes. Uh, I think they have they are shown to be useful, and one of the major trials that is often quoted is the PROGRESS trial. ERBs, longer acting, and uh, the ne nephrologists tend to believe that ERBs are better than AC inhibitors. The cardiologists tend to believe AC inhibitors are better than ERBs, but I think this debate will go on, but that is a final point. Both are good drugs, and you can use any one of them. Life study showed again uh, that uh, Lozartan definitely was superior to Atenolol in improving the long term results in hypertension, even systolic hypertension. So, finally, beta blockers, as you can see, they have come way down. Uh, beta blockers seem to be taking a lot of B, I mean, many, you know, three large trial life as as Allahat and uh, <coughs> LLP, all of them clearly showed that for some unexplained reason, the mortality among patients with beta blocker was higher compared to patients who are on either diadropyridines or AC inhibitors or ARBs. And because of that, uh, beta blockers are not the first choice of drug, especially in elderly. It has been shown that they are not of much use, especially drugs like atronolol are definitely not recommended now. Uh, metoprolol, long acting or delayed uh, action seem to be preferred, but in elderly and our isolated systolic hypertension, they are not the first drugs of choice, uh, especially in a city where I come from, like Bangalore, where there is a very high incidence of allergic bronchitis. They, they have a problem in using this drug and they have not found really any major advantage. What surprises me is that none of the guidelines mention about centrally acting drugs. Uh, I, I really do not know. Of course, one of the reasons attributed in all the guidelines and all the trials is that there is a major side effect of postural hypertension and uh, many other side effects of the drug. And in elderly, especially we know already they have a problem of uh, you know the autonomic nervous system and there is a higher incidence of postural hypertension in elderly and probably these drugs will worsen. But let me tell you, though it is not really mentioned in any of the guidelines, in my own practice, I have found that patients with systolic hypertension respond very well to the centrally acting drugs. Yes, one should be cautious. There are many side effects. 
the drug I usually prefer is clonidine because I found that it has less chance of postural hypertension compared to methyl dopa. Methyl dopa definitely produces much more postural hypertension compared to clonidine. But clonidine has a lot more side effects like dryness of the mouth, drowsiness, and very uncomfortable. And major problem is rebound hypertension because they are especially elderly, they have a tendency for you know, forgetfulness and if they stop the drug abruptly, it can be a rebound hypertension and can have more problems. Uh, but most of the guidelines do not mention the role of centrally acting drug, I must uh, tell you. But personally, I feel they are a good good drugs in the management of the isolated systolic hypertension. Alpha blockers, uh, again, because of the other side effects, especially postural hypertension, again, are not the first line of drug. But in some of those elderly who have prostatic symptoms, wherein alpha blockers have a beneficial effect. Maybe you can use them, but not as a primary drug. Uh, you can add on in case there is a need for more than two drugs and patient has uh, you no know, prostatic symptom, maybe alpha blockers can be given. Now what here is uh, clearly shows is these two, that is diuretic chlorothalidone and dihydropyridines are the drugs of choice in large number of patients with systolic, isolated systolic hypertension. These drugs are like specific indication. Patient has hypertension with systolic hypertension with congestive cardiac failure. I think there is a role for AC inhibitors, ARB. Hypertension with renal dysfunction, maybe there is a role for AC inhibitors, ARB along with this. Uh, patient with Coronary uh, hypertension, systolic hypertension with coronary artery disease or angina. I think a combination of this with beta blockers are useful. I mean, as we go down, these drugs become, uh, you know, specific drugs for a comorbid condition, not the first choice of drug on patients with isolated systolic hypertension. To summarize our uh, you know, recommendation in the elderly antihypertensive. Treatment is highly beneficial. We have clearly shown that it is useful. In patients aged more than 65 years, the proportional benefit is no less than in younger patients. Large meta-analysis do not support the claim that antihypertensive drug classes significantly differ in their ability to lower BP or exert CV protection both in younger and elderly patients. That is what I alluded to. The many believe that it is the antihypertensive effect or the reduction in blood pressure that is important than any specific class of drug unless there are compelling indication as I said congestive cardiac failure associated congestive cardiac failure definitely AC inhibitors are found to be superior beta blocker are superior compared to dihydropyridines the choice of the drug to employ should thus not be guided by age thiazide diuretics AC inhibitor, calcium channel blockers, ARBs and beta blockers can be considered for initiation, maintenance of treatment also in the elderly. In the elderly, outcome trials are only addressed patients with an entry systolic blood pressure of more than 160. Now, whether, you know, we have this group where the definition of systolic hypertension is above one systolic blood pressure above 140. Now, if we treat uh, blood pressure, so 140, 148 or 150, is that benefit seen? The data is still not very clear, but applying the rule that is seen in uh, other and, uh, hypertensive patients, I think we may presume that treating a uh, so blood pressure of 150 is equally beneficial. Common sense considerations suggest that also in the elderly, drug treatment can be initiated when the systolic blood pressure is more than 140 with the goal of going below this value. Treatment should be conducted with particular attention to adverse response, potentially more frequent in the elderly, especially the postural hypertension. One should be cautious. This is the algorithm that recommended. That means if the blood pressure is very high irrespective of what we should treat. If the blood pressure is in this age group, in this range group, 160 to 100, we should again treat. In this group, 140 to 159, if there is a target organ damage, 
or if there is a diabetes i mean diabetes has a special significance where repeatedly has been shown so even if there is no dog at diagram damage no cardiovascular complication association of diabetes one should treat bring down the blood pressure or if the 10 year cardiovascular risk is more than 20% one should treat this patient rest of them it should be just a lifestyle modification and you know observe this patient follow this patient and if the pressure goes up one should treat uh, this is overall the management of isolated systolic hypertension we will take the questions later on thank you